Hello and welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Days. My name is Sam and I'll be your host for today and we're going to get to talk about Crocodilians 101. So we get to, we have a question for you in chat. Um, do you like alligators or crocodiles more? Do you like alligators or crocodiles more? Um, we have captions for this program, so if you click on the CC button, um, you should see those. And then we also have them at a separate link, which is currently pinned in chat. So you can uh, choose, click on that, and you can see the captions in a separate window as well. This program is being recorded, and we will be posting it to our Reptile and Amphibian Days homepage. So if you want to check back and see the different species that we're going to get to talk about, um, feel free to do so. And if you have any questions or comments relevant to the program, please type them in chat and we'll be answering either in the chat or aloud if we have time. And with that, I am interested, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Greg, who is our curator of the Naturalist Center at the museum. Thanks so much for speaking with us today, Greg, and I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, and good morning to all our friends on YouTube. Let me make sure I got the right one up there, Sam. Mm -hmm. How's it look at your end? Good? Looks great. Awesome. So yeah, today we're going to be covering all things crocodilians. Um, before I started at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, I was fortunate enough to work uh, along the coast of Georgia as an alligator biologist. Uh, so in a, um, a span of about four years between 2011 and 2015, I caught hundreds of alligators like you see in this picture here. And I did all sorts of cool, interesting research with them. But I also spot, spent a lot of time educating folks about alligator natural history, how to be safe around alligators, and also providing people with a safe uh, chance to encounter and touch alligators like you see in this picture. So today we're going to talk about what is a crocodilian, and then we're going to cover the, some of the crocodilians you can find throughout the entire planet. And then I want to focus more on my research with American alligators here in the United States. So my question to you is what is a crocodilian? So go ahead and drop your answers in that YouTube chat. This could be a particular species that comes to mind when you hear the word crocodilian, or it could be some sort of physical attribute that you think of. Yeah, and also as far as the poll for alligators and crocodiles at the beginning, I think I'm seeing more alligator love in the chat here. Um, <laughs> well, people, a couple of people said uh, crocodiles, but for the for the most part, and Carrie was saying that it was it's impossible to choose because they're all so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I I think I would have to pick alligators because I spent so much of my life researching them. Yeah, uh, but I think we're going to see that there are an amazing variety of crocodilians. So uh, maybe that your minds will be changed by the end of this. Definitely, definitely. All right. Um, and let me see if there's anything in chat as far as what we think a crocodilian is. I don't know if I'm seeing any characteristics yet. When I think crocodilian, I think um, I think of animals that kind of look like logs when they're floating in the water. <laughs> sure, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, um, Katrina says that they're guessing that an animal in the same group as the gators and the crocodiles. Okay. Um, Brendan says alligator mississippiensis. Very good. Yeah. It's a scientific name. Uh-huh. Well, let's yeah, take a look. Yeah. So most crocodilians are going to be large reptiles. Um, and because they're reptiles, they of course are cold-blooded or ectothermic, so they rely on external sources of heat uh, to fuel their, their processes. Um, they're covered in osteoderm. So if we look at the back of this alligator here, you can kind of see all these bumpy ridges. Those are actually bony plates that sit right underneath the surface of the skin. And most crocodilians are long-lived. Um, so this animal that you see pictured is probably several decades old. One thing that probably doesn't come to many people's minds is the heart. Crocodilians actually have one of the most sophisticated circulatory systems in the whole animal kingdom. Um, that's because they have a four chambered heart, just like you and I, uh, but that they have this really cool ability to shunt blood. So that means that they are able to take blood that has gone through their body and bypass the lungs and send it back through their body. 
And you might want, wonder why in the world would they want to do that? Wouldn't they want to get more oxygen from the lungs? Well, by shunting blood and sending it back through the body, that blood had a, has a lot of carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide helps produce gastric acid in the stomach so that they can digest their food. So by able to sh shunt blood, they can better digest their food, which is a pretty cool attribute to uh, eating big prey items that we'll talk about a little later. All crocodilians have what is known as a nictitating membrane. And so what we're gonna see in this video is that the, the alligator is gonna open one eyelid and then the nictitating membrane or the third eyelid is going to move across from left to right. I know the video is a little choppy, but we should see it. Here it goes there. Um, and, and so this nictitating membrane protects their eye when they're swimming underwater. And what I learned in preparing for this presentation is that actually dogs have this too. We just don't see it a lot. Um, of course, when I think of crocodilians, I think of teeth. Uh, they all have lots of sharp teeth that sit in sockets inside their mouth. And one other thing, um, which is kind of hard to see, but along the jaw of this American alligator, they have all these little pits. And those little pits are the site of these sensory organs that allow the alligator, and all crocodilians have these, and it allows them to um, change differences in pressure. It may even help detect changes in salinity, but all crocodilians have these little sense organs in their skin. All crocodilians have this uh, really handy flap of skin at the back of their throat. You can see it pictured right there. Uh, that's called the palatal valve. And that's because these animals live primarily in water and they're gonna catch prey items while they're in the water. And it would be really hard for you to eat a cheeseburger if you're in a swimming pool. So what this, this flap of skin does, it allows them to close their throat. So if they're catching prey underwater, they're not drinking a whole bunch of water or drowning themselves while they're trying to catch prey. So they can open and close that on command and it's an adaptation to helping them catch prey underwater. And of course, I think we all know that they are carnivorous. So all crocodilians, all modern crocodilians are carnivorous. So they eat a whole host of prey items. Um, and in this picture here, you see an alligator uh, working on the remains of a white-tailed deer. And uh, crocodilians can't chew their food like you and I. So what they do is they usually, they'll, they'll kill a bigger item uh, like this deer, and then they'll kind of store it for a while until it starts to break down. And then when it's time to eat, they'll bite on and then they'll do a little spin and they'll rip off little chunks of flesh that they can swallow whole. Not only do crocodilians eat mammals, they eat birds and a whole host of other things. Um, this is a picture I took in Georgia of an alligator trying to ambush these roseate spoonbills. Uh, I didn't even know this animal was there. I was actually just trying to take a picture of the bird. And that's because they're great stealthy predators, right? They can lie underwater, their, their eyes and their nostrils at, their, at the top of their head so they can breathe and see, uh, but the animals that they're trying to, to eat can't see them because they're so well concealed. Those are those lo logs that you mentioned hanging out in the water, Sam. And then they propel themselves out of the water using strong limbs and hopefully they catch a prey item. In this case, the birds all got away. So crocodilians are important because of the, the role they play in the food web, both as predator and as prey. Uh, small crocodilians will be food items for um, birds or large turtles or maybe raccoons. So here you see a great blue heron eating a freshly hatched American alligator. And Greg, we have a lot of comments in chat um, of observations about like, a few of the pictures that you shared so far. A lot of a lot of is or the for when, with the uh, the deer slide, and then also um, really cool, lots of cools in chat about the um, the palatal valve. And we have a question um, from Katrina about the palatal valve. Um, do you think that if they catch the the food on land, do you think that the crocodilians don't put the, like use the palatal valve as much? Yeah, they, there wouldn't be a need for them to have that shut uh, if, if they were on land. Um, you know, most of the, the hunting is gonna be done where land meets water, right? So they can conceal themselves and then 
propel themselves out of the water and surprise their prey. Um, but you know, if you go to like um, an alligator farm where these animals are in captivity and they're feeding them like rats or something like that on land, um, they would catch it and then just swallow it whole. So yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to worry about swallowing water in that case. All right, great, thank you. So yeah, um, crocodilians are important because of where they sit in the food web, um, but a lot of them also create habitat for other species. So here you see a picture of a, a female American alligator and she has created a den underneath a fallen tree. So, she, um, you know, this tree when it fell over kind of created a nice cavity and then she excavated a nice little place to hide out underneath there. So this is gonna be a good spot for not only her, but you can imagine like a, a frog or a toad um, enjoying it down there as well. Um, some crocodilians also dig wallows, which are essentially kind of like little swimming pools. They'll, they'll dig out a little spot in the dirt and when it rains, um, that wallow will collect water. And sometimes in times of drought, that's the only place for fresh water. And so you're gonna find amphibians and birds using that habitat alongside the crocodilians. So another attribute of crocodilians is that they all lay eggs. Um, the ones pictured here are from an American alligator. You can see that they're kind of, they're, well, they're large, right? In comparison to my hand, they're oblong, so they're more oval shaped. And if you were to try to crack it, it's actually really hard to crack. Um, that's because crocodilians are gonna be laying their eggs around water. And if there's a flood, they don't want those eggs to get filled up with water and, and drown the developing embryo. So that hard shell protects them from water going in and out. Now they're still permeable, so like gases and stuff like that can be exchanged, um, but that hard shell is, is a good barrier to water. Um, some crocodilians will build nest mounds, like you see this large one here next to me, that's from an alligator. Um, other uh, species will actually dig their nest into like sand and, and bury it in the ground, kind of like we think a, a turtle nesting. And when they're born, all crocodilians are small. So we usually think of them as these really big animals, but they all start off as these really, in my opinion, super cute, uh, like six to 10 inch long, uh, baby crocodilians. So there's one. Here's what a whole clutch looks like right after they were born. I, I think I counted around 27 in this, uh, this bin here that we caught to mark. So all crocodilians have these physical attributes and they all have common ancestry as well. So if we look at this very simplified family tree, what we see is that the closest living relative to the crocodilians is going to be the birds and birds and crocodilians split about 250 million years ago. And in those 250 million years, there have been all sorts of unique, diverse things in that crocodilian family, things that we refer to as crocodilomorphs. So, um, you know, like 200 million years ago, there were things that we would, wouldn't even consider to be uh, crocodilians unless you were like a paleontology who knew, paleontologists who knew which, which bones and uh, the skull and, and how that co corresponds to modern day species. So the things that we can look at and call like an alligator or a crocodile didn't first appear until about 80 million years ago. And some of you may be familiar with some of these uh, prehistoric creatures. Uh, the only one that I'm going to share with you here is uh, Dinosuchus. That's because it was the largest predator in what is now North America about 70 to 80 million years ago. There are estimates that put this animal up to about 39 feet long and at least 8,000 pounds. So this was a huge prehistoric animal that would be in the, uh, the alligator family. But we're not going to have time to cover all those prehistoric creatures but I do encourage you to, to spend some time exploring those. So nowadays we have 24 species of crocodilians in three different families. So we have the alligator family with eight species. So there are two species of alligators, the American alligator right here in the United States. And then if you go across the other side of the globe, uh, the Chinese alligator is in China. And then we have six species of caiman which are found in Central and South America. There are about 14 species of um, animal in the crocodile family. And I say about is because with um, current DNA work um, and studying the genetics of these animals, 
we're learning a whole lot. So this number has changed in recent, in recent years. Um, but yeah, there's about 14 or so species in here, maybe more. And then there are one or two species in the uh, gharial family. And again, um, there's been some debate. The, the one on the picture on top here is the true gharial, and the one below it is called the, called the, the false gharial. So there's kind of a debate whether it should be in the family with the gharials or in the family with the crocodiles. And so what I want to do now is uh, spend some time highlighting some of the more unique species throughout the globe. But before I do that, Sam, are there any questions? Yeah, so we have some questions um, just about like general cro uh, crocodilian, like how fast do they move and how far can they stretch or jump, do you know? Yeah, so um, I don't have an exact like mile per hour in terms of how fast they run. Uh, I remember mm -hmm. seeing somewhere like 15 miles per hour. I'll tell you an antidote once. I was uh, doing some research and we were on a golf course in Georgia and um, we we're driving around a golf course and we were, we were looking for alligators in the water where we typically find them. And I looked over and I saw um, a small like four foot alligator on, on the fairway. And I was like, okay, I'll just go catch that one. And we'll mark, mark it up. And uh, I stepped out of the golf cart to go get it. And that alligator took off faster than I would ever be able to run. And it went and dived straight into that pond and I never saw it again. Wow. So, <laughs> Even on land, they are very athletic and they can run faster than, than, than you can. Uh, but that being said, since they are reptiles, um, the way that their body responds to that physical effort is different from ours. You and I, and well, not me, uh, at one point in my life, you could run a marathon, right? Many miles. Um, a crocodile could run for maybe a few seconds before uh, it got exhausted and had to stop and rest. Um, right. And then there's something about jumping, and that's oh, yeah. going to depend on the species. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit when we talk about the Cuban crocodile. Okay, cool. And we had some questions about their eggs. Um, you said that the eggs are, are hard to, to break. Um, are they leathery or are they more like a chicken egg? Sure. That's, um, yeah, let's go back to that picture real quick. Yeah, so they are, they're hard. They are, um, they're not leathery. They are crunchy. <laughs> those, those things are solid. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, most of the time, the, the female ha actually has to come back to the nest and excavate that nest so that the babies can get out of there. And um, not, not all of the, the young um, hatchlings could actually get out of the egg because it is so tough. So sometimes the mommy has to pick up the egg and crush it in the with her teeth she doesn't hurt the, the hatchling, but it cracks the egg open so that the, the young ones can, can get out. And I have a video of this, uh, which is about four minutes long on my YouTube channel. And um, if they haven't done so already, they can drop that in the chat and you can yes, watch Yes, I posted whole. that in chat, but we can put it up again if, if awesome. you need it. Um, okay, and then also you were talking about that. So since they have that hard shell, it's, it protects them against like if the nest gets flooded, for instance, do they ever have to worry about the opposite where it, um, like it would have, could they dry out? Um, you know, I would imagine in extreme conditions, possibly. Um, but you know, these eggs aren't being laid on the surface. They're, they're inside nest mounds or underground. So th this big nest mound here in the case of the American alligator, you know, the eggs are a good way down. And so they are being protected. Um, it, it's a nice warm, humid area inside there. That nest is made up of dirt and leaves and twigs and stuff. So it's moist in there and it's, and it's warm. Um, and so they're pretty well protected in there. Now, if right. like a, I would say, I'll add, if like a predator was to dig up the nest, like a raccoon dug it up and there was an egg laying on the ground, that's probably not going to be a good situation. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. That's all we have for now. I'm going to save the rest of them for later on. Great question. Thank you. All right, so let's take a trip around the world and learn about just a handful of the crocodilians that live on our planet. So, you know, a lot of times when I think of a crocodilian, my mind goes to those really large ones or you know, ones that Hollywood shows us in the movies, but not all of them are really big. Um, the smallest in the world is the Cuvier's dwarf caiman. So this is a species that lives kind of in the Amazon basin in South America. And 
this animal only gets to about three or five feet long and maybe 15 pounds. So not very big at all. On the other side of the spectrum is the really large crocodile that I think of a lot because it's one of my favorite species. Uh, this is the saltwater crocodile. And this is the largest reptile on the planet. Um, it is about, it can grow to about 23 feet long and 2000 pounds. The one that you see pictured here, um, this was an animal that was actually caught and moved uh, to uh, captivity. And it was um, something like 20 feet long and uh, 2,370 pounds. Uh, its name was Long Long. He has since passed, uh, but this was the largest crocodilian ever held in captivity. You can see in the bottom left corner of the screen is a little range map um, that shows you everywhere in the world that these um, saltwater crocodiles are found. You often hear them on the northern side of um, Australia, as well as the Philippines and, and places like that. And crocodilians have the strongest bite force of any animal that currently lives on our planet. Yeah, there are some prehistoric animals like the T-Rex and that um, Dinosuchus that we saw before that had stronger bite forces. But if we consider the animals that are um, currently alive, the saltwater crocodile and then the American alligator um, and probably the Nile crocodile are well, uh, are in the top three. And uh, this guy that you see pictured here working out of Florida did a study. I would have loved to have been part of this study. They uh, got every species of crocodilian from, um, from a from like a zoo uh, alligator farm setting. And they had them bite down on this device that measured bite force. And what they found is that the saltwater crocodile exerts 3,700 pounds per square inch, which is absolutely incredible. You and I, if we bite into like a piece of steak, will exert about 150 to 200 pounds of pressure per square inch. So just super strong animals. The toothiest of all of the crocodilians is going to be the gharial. Um, this is a critically endangered species um, that is currently really only found in India. They have these long slender snouts and 110 teeth that line that snout. And you may wonder why in the world does it look like this? This is actually an adaptation to catching fish. So they're pretty much their entire diet is fish. So that long slender snout allows them to very quickly move underwater, move their head side to side and more effectively catch fish as they swim around them. And you'll also notice this little bulbous thing at the end of the snout here. This particular individual is a male and that little bump there helps uh, amplify the noises that he makes uh, during the breeding season to attract females. And just like the gharial, um, the Philippines crocodile is critically endangered as well. In fact, it is considered the rarest of all the crocodile species. You know, there are a whole host of things that threaten not just crocodilians, but all animals on this planet. Um, but in, in this particular case, it's really just because the Philippines crocodile has such a small range. Uh, if you look at the range map, you know, there's just this one little tiny spot of yellow where they can be found. That's because this uh, species was once considered a subspecies to another animal, and then it was kind of classified as its own thing. Um, so there's just not a whole lot of them left in the wild, only about a hundred. Um, you know, people hunting them and removing them because they perceive them as a threat is a, a big issue as well. But fortunately, there are crocodilian biologists throughout the world working to conserve these species. And there's been some efforts to breed these animals in the wild and then re release them into their native habitat. And then the award for the most intelligent and likely also the most athletic goes to the Cuban crocodile. Again, this is another endangered species. It's got a small range down there in Cuba. Uh, it, it also suffers from interbreeding. It will interbreed with the, um, the American crocodile. Because of that, the genetics kind of get diluted and uh, it's hard to say if we have a whole lot of pure Cuban crocodiles left in the wild. But a lot of people that work with crocodilians, especially in captivity, 
uh, have noted how intelligent the Cuban crocodiles are. There's also been some evidence of them uh, displaying pack hunting, so grouping, uh, hunting in a group in captivity. Um, this hasn't been proven, but there have been some anecdotal observations of this happening. And um, this is, what, uh, again, one of the most athletic animals as well. Uh, they are known to leap out of the water and catch prey items that are sitting on tree limbs, um, like, you know, small mammals or birds that are just, you know, um, on a branch over the water. So they have the uh, great uh, ability to leap. And you can go online and, you know, somebody asked about their ability to jump. Uh, if you, you know, Google alligator jumping or something like that, you'll see them propel themselves out of water. Um, all the way past, you know, like in one third of their tail and like the whole animal is, is out of the water. So they have incredibly powerful tails that allows them to, to leap and propel themselves upward. And of course, I think a lot of people perceive crocodilians as, as dangerous. And, you know, this is true to an extent, um, especially if you, if you live in certain areas of the world where there are a lot of crocodilians and where people spend uh, more time in and around the water in which these animals live. So you imagine if you had to go collect water from a river or do your laundry in the river, you're gonna be put in closer proximity to animals um, such as this now crocodile. And this is largely considered the most dangerous crocodilian in the world. It accounts for about 300 to 600 attacks per year. But closer to home, we don't have to worry about Nile crocodiles. We just have three species here, which I'll talk about in a, in a, a minute. So I'm gonna ask you to drop in the chat, which of the following animals do you think is the most dangerous? Is it the cow, dogs, alligators, or bees? And, and when I say dangerous, this is the number of deaths on an annual basis. All right, so while we're waiting on those, we've got a couple more questions, if you mm -hmm. wouldn't mind. Um, okay, so we're talking about how you mentioned that modern crocodiles were uh, carnivorous. Um, so Sarah was asking, were non-modern crocodiles plant eaters or herbivorous? Yeah, um, not most of them are and were carnivorous, um, but these crocodilomorphs, these things that existed from like 80 million years ago to 250 million years ago, they filled a lot of different niches. So that is, they were, uh, some of them lived on land. Um, some of them walked more like on two legs. Some of them were vegetarian. Um, I'm not an expert in this subject. I'm not a paleontologist, but if you go online, uh, or if you get a book on like um, prehistoric animals, you can see the diversity of these crocodilomorphs that lived before. But the general rule is that, yeah, most of them were still carnivorous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Brendan mentioned that, um, talking about keystone species, Brendan was asking, are all crocodilians keystone species or is it just some members like the alligator? And what is a keystone species? Yeah, and a keystone species is, is one that has like a profound impact on the environment in which they lived. And if you were to remove that animal from that um, ecosystem, from that habitat, uh, you're gonna see a cascade of effects, of typically negative effects uh, on the surrounding environment, the food web. Um, but yeah, typically when we're dealing with uh, large carnivorous predators, um, you know, ones that have an important role in the food chain, ones that are able to um, create habitat for other species, uh, I would consider all 24 species uh, a keystone species. Um, just because they are such important members of the ecosystems in, in which they live. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so as far as what people think is the most dangerous animal, we're actually getting pretty mixed answers. Um, most of them, I believe, are cows and dogs, I believe, are the two answers that were the most common, but bees are, bees are following that. How can you think that adorable dog there could be harmful? That's, I know, right? That's my sweet, sweet that baby little girl. sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look. So, um, in fact, the answer is bees. And this is easier to, to comprehend when you think of people who, uh, who may re respond negatively, uh, go into anaphylactic shock, or have an allergic reaction if they're stung by a 
bee or wasp or hornet. Uh, so because of those allergic reactions, uh, those stinging insects are the deadliest animals in the United States. Um, dogs are actually up there. They account for on, uh, on average 28 deaths per year. And then cows are 20 per year. And then down at the bottom are those animals that are so often vilified in popular culture and by the media. Alligators, one or less than one death per year, same with sharks and bears. Um, that being said, you know, they still are big, powerful animals with really sharp teeth. So they're not as deadly or as dangerous as most people believe, but we still have to be safe around crocodilians. And to do so, you want to keep a safe distance. Um, you never want to feed them unless you're in um, a controlled environment like an alligator farm where they allow that sort of thing. You'd never want to feed a wild alligator. That's because they learn to associate food with humans in that case, and then that's when they become dangerous. And ultimately just respect the animal and the environment in which they live. And yeah, once in a while, um, and it is tragic when it happens, um, there have been about 30 to 40 alligator fatalities since we started keeping records back in like the, the 1940s. And it's a terrible thing when it happens. Um, but alligators uh, may actually help save lives one day. And, um, so there's been some research out of like Louisiana and some other places where they have exposed alligator blood to um, bacteria, some that are resistant to antibiotics, as well as um, certain strange, uh, strains of the HIV virus. And what they find is that um, this alligator blood is able to destroy antibiotic resistant bacteria and can inhibit HIV-1 infection. So the, the key to you know, solving some human illnesses may reside in the blood of crocodilians. And that's largely probably because these animals have evolved over you know, millions of years to live in pretty nasty environments. If you think of like a, a marsh or a swamp, um, and they can also sustain pretty brutal uh, attacks by other alligators or other species. I've seen animals that have, don't have a tail or are missing legs and they're able to recover and, and heal just fine. And so maybe the key to, to solving some of our health issues resides in the blood of these animals. So let's uh, switch gears just a little bit and um, focus all of our energy on the United States. We, we took a nice overview of what is a crocodilian. We explored some of those species that live on the planet, but now I wanna focus on home. So we have three species of crocodilians that live in the United States. The, the first is the American crocodile. And if you look at the range map, you can see uh, just at the Southern tip of Florida, a little dot of green. That's the only place in the United States where you're going to find the American crocodile. It's also the only place in the entire world where you're gonna find crocodiles and alligators living side by side, is in like the Everglades. We have another species um, established in Florida, the common caiman. Um, this animal was brought up in like the 70s or 80s probably um, as part of the pet trade and then released into the wild. And there's a very small established population of caimans now in, in South Florida. But of course, the most numerous in the Southeastern United States is going to be the American alligator. This species ranges from Texas all the way up to North Carolina. So before we go any further, I wanna see if you know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. So let's drop those answers in the chat and then Sam, I'll pause to see if there are any questions. Yeah, um, can I answer this question? Go ahead. <laughs> so an alligator you see later and a crocodile you see in a while. Exactly right, nailed that is That is the answer. <laughs> yeah, see you later alligator and in a while crocodile. All right. Um, okay. So for for uh, our questions that we've gotten so far, um, uh, let's see. We actually you mentioned you answered a lot of these ones. Um, there was a, a mention of like um, of um, making various clothing out of um, 
uh, crocodilian skin and things like that. Um, and you might talk about that with like conservation and things like that, but I wasn't sure if I should save that one for a little bit. You know, that's a great point and I can address it now. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, um, let's use the example of the American alligator. So the American alligator was listed as endangered back in 1967. Um, so this actually predated the Endangered Species Act of 1973. So alligators uh, have were one of the first protected species in the U.S. Um, and nowadays, there are millions of them across their range. And one of the reasons for that is, yeah, there are great uh, research efforts and conservation measures put in place, uh, but we also established a, a market for them and alligator pro products. And with that comes all sorts of regulation. And, you know, there are legal hunts throughout many of the uh, states in the alligators range. You can um, buy alligator products as long as it's done legally and they have the permit and all the proper paperwork to do that. And by creating a market and a demand for these things and legalizing this and putting in place laws and legislation, um, it has in enhanced protection for the species. So we see them raised in captivity. There's protection in the wild. Uh, there's a lot of money that goes into the hunting them, which is in turn used for conservation. So um, th that is one of the really key components is, is taking an animal that is often vilified and persecuted and illegally removed um, from the wild and establishing a legal, very heavily regulated market for them. Um, so that is actually, um, a, a, a good thing. Now, of course, there has to be enough animals in the wild to do that. You want, wouldn't want to establish like a, a legal hunt or a market for something like uh, um, the Philippines crocodile that we talked of where there's only a hundred left in the wild. In that case, you want to focus conservation efforts into like captive breeding and releasing things into the wild. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great Thank question. You. So what, yeah, what are they saying good. about the differences between alligators and um, So the, the majority of people are answering that the snout shape is different. So it's more U-shaped in gators and more V-shaped in crocodiles. Um, and then uh, we also had a mention of the crocodile's bottom teeth can be seen as far as like the teeth go. Um, but yeah, yeah, the snout, the snout shape is the, the most common yeah. notice difference. You're all correct for sure. Good job. So well done, everybody. Yeah, so alligators typically have more of a U-shaped broad snout, and our crocodili or crocodiles have more of a V-shaped snout. And this is largely um, alligators have evolved to eat more, uh, you know, their, their diet is diverse, but by having a broad uh, snout like that, it increases their ability to eat hard-shelled items like turtles, or like uh, crabs or stuff like they might find in the marsh. Um, so that's really the reason behind that really broad snout there. And uh, as somebody else mentioned about the teeth, I like to say that crocodiles have more of a gnarly smile. Looks like they need to go to the dentist, but the alligators, their bottom teeth actually kind of fit nicely into their upper jaw. And so they have um, a much nicer set of teeth. A couple other ways to tell them apart is that alligators, uh, only live in temperate or cooler areas, like imagine them living in North Carolina, you would never find a crocodile this far north. Um, so here you see um, a picture of a really cool behavior that they can do. Um, this is, um, I think these pictures were taken in South Carolina, where it gets cold enough so that the water freezes once in a while. And so the alligator can put the, their nostrils out of the water, uh, their heart rate is reduced to like one beat per minute. They're getting all the oxygen that they need uh, through their nostrils sticking out of the water there. And then the pond will actually freeze around them. This is a behavior known as icing. And you'd never see this in a, a crocodile because they live closer to the equator or just uh, more tropical, warmer environments. Similarly, um, their habitat is different. Uh, alligators really are only going to live in freshwater. Now they can tolerate uh, marshes and even like trips into the ocean, but alligators have to live in, in freshwater. And that's because they don't have salt glands like crocodiles. 
Cracked owls actually have specialized salt glands that remove excess salt from their body. So that allows crocodiles to, uh, to live in places like the ocean or in more marshy brash, uh, brackish areas as well. So, um, you know, there are other differences as well, like looking at their skull and, their, and some of their other uh, like scoop patterns or scale patterns. Uh, but those are some of the big difference uh, between alligators and crocodiles. So we talked a little bit about conservation and the importance of establishing uh, legal markets for these animals. But of course, we have to do things to protect their habitat. You know, habitat destruction and alteration is one of the biggest threats facing pretty much any species on this planet. So here you see um, some work being done on a golf course, which um, is actually perfect habitat for alligators and other crocodilians. So here's actually an example of humans creating habitat for uh, a crocodilian species like the alligator. You have these permanent bodies of water. Uh, you also have these culverts or these big pipes, which are nice uh, places for the animals to hide. Um, but of course, while we do this, we also destroy habitat. You know, this site could have been like really nice marsh habitat. Um, so we're changing the places where these animals live. We're also building things like roads, or in this case, this is actually a runway uh, down at my field site in Georgia, where this animal now has to cross to get from the freshwater pond to the marsh where it feeds. And so it's putting itself at risk of being hit by a car or even a plane in this case. And by living in areas uh, where there are you know, high human uh, populations, um, there is room for conflict where somebody might see this animal in be fearful of it and report it as a nuisance animal. And in, in some areas, if you're, you know, the animal is reported, reported as a nuisance, it has to be removed from the population. And of course, like I talked about, um, feeding crocodilians is, is really bad for them because, you know, it's, it's not the best diet to be eating something like a bagel, but they also will then lose their fear of human. They'll get uh, closer and closer to people and that's when they become dangerous. And that's where some of those fatalities and some of those accidents happened. And there's also lots of injuries that uh, crocodilians sustain just by living around people. So if any of you turned into the sea turtles program yesterday with the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, this is an image taken at that very same facility in the veterinary suite. Uh, so this was an animal that we had captured to, uh, to put a, a tracking device on uh, as part of our research study. And what we noticed is that the animal had a wound to the head. So we took a radiograph or an X-ray of that animal. And what we found is um, a very obvious fish hook here. You know, this could have been incidental. Animal could have seen, you know, somebody fishing and then went over and grabbed the bait. Um, but this was very much on purpose. This here is gunshot wound. So somebody shot this animal. Um, fortunately, it survived. And here we see another example of somebody trying to illegally hunt uh, an animal in a protected area. This uh, is actually at the tip of a harpoon uh, that somebody uh, inflicted upon this um, seven foot female alligator. So we have you know, direct persecution of people trying to remove these animals from the wild, uh, but then indirectly pollution can have a negative impact on these animals. So drop in the chat what you think these are um, this is the remains of a, an eight foot alligator. You can see these are the vertebrae here. Those bony plates are the osteoderms that I talked of. And this is where the stomach would have been. I know this is kind of a gross photo, but those objects are actually tennis balls. So for whatever reason, that animal was eating tennis balls. You know, maybe that bright color floating on the surface looked attractive. They ate them. Maybe somebody threw these at the animal trying to elicit some sort of response. But for whatever reason, the animal ate them, got sick, and died. So there are lots of threats facing um, not only alligators here at home, but crocodilians across the planet. So what do we do to research these animals and learn more about them so that we can protect them? One of the easiest things that we could do um, takes very little effort is just to go out and see where they're living and how many are in a population. And to do that, we can do spotlight surveys. Alligators have um, 
and all crocodilians have something called the tapetum lucidum in their eye. Um, so this is a structure that re reflects um, light. So, and it helps with them seeing it, uh, under low light conditions. If you ever take a photo of your kitty cat at home, you're gonna notice that your cat uh, eyes are glowing back at you. It's because they have this same structure to allow them to see in darkness. So by shining a spotlight across the pond or water body, we can count each of the little individual eyes staring back at us. And if you get good, you can um, even estimate how large some of those animals are. But with a lot of studies, you actually have to catch the animal so that you can collect data. So the way that I, and, and really a lot of researchers catch these animals is by using um, a treble hook. That is uh, what you see here, it's got this big weight on it, um, and then three sharp little prongs and uh, a fishing pole. So we essentially go fishing for alligators. We would cast the, the line over the alligator's back and we reel it in and you can see it's just enough to snag their, their thick hide. And then we can reel it in, like catching the biggest bass you've ever caught. And when we get it near the, uh, the shoreline, we use tools. So this is not like in the movies or on TV where they just like jump on these animals and are kind of reckless. We're always using the proper tools and trying to keep a safe distance before the animal is properly restrained. So here you see a paint pole. It has a snare or a noose on the end that we will attach to the alligator right behind the head that allows us to pull it out of the water and then we can restrain it. And we use um, electrical tape to, to tape the eyes shut and that's so that the animal isn't stressed out. You can imagine if it was seeing everything going on around it, it might be pretty stressed out. Uh, but we found that by closing the eyes, they kind of chill out a little bit. And of course we got to restrain that, that jaw for our own safety. Um, but here, this is the largest alligator that I caught in my time in Georgia. This animal was uh, about 11 and a half feet long. And so some of the data that we collect from these animals, uh, you can see us taking a, a, a length me measurement. So that total length can be used to um, determine how old the animal is, at least give a rough estimate of how old the animal is. We also um, take blood samples. We can um, do basically um, like you go to the doctor and your doctor takes your blood and then looks at various levels of things inside the blood to say if you're healthy or not. We do the same thing. So we would take that back to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center where we can do a, a simple blood plant panel uh, to see how healthy the animal was. And we could also store some of that blood for later studies as well. In this photo, you also see um, a GPS logger that we've attached to the back of the animal. Um, so this is a field of study called uh, wildlife telemetry, and this is remotely tracking animals and their movements through using things like uh, this GPS logger here. Before the animal is released, we um, will mark their, their tail. Uh, I know it's a little gnarly because there's some blood, um, but there's not a whole lot of blood um, uh, tissues or uh, blood vessels here in these tail scoots. But we do this is because these won't grow back and it's a very easy way to, to mark the animals. This is a unique code to that uh, specific individual so that we know exactly who we're dealing with. During our time uh, in Georgia, we also use these cattle tags that you might see in the ear of like a cow. Um, and that's because we wanted the public to have a very easy way to identify uh, the animal. So if they had a problem with an alligator, they can call up me and say, hey, Greg, uh, there's an alligator number three that's red, you know, causing trouble in my house. And I would know exactly where that animal liked to live and I could return that animal to the proper location. So here's me getting ready to release an animal. You can see um, the GPS logger at the, the back of the, the head there and it's properly restrained. And then when we go to actually release the animal, we do it from a distance. So I'm gonna show you a short video. Hopefully this works well. And you can see the animal being released. The mouth is never open until we're far away. So my friend Rick is gonna jump off the alligator. I pull the tape free. If you look, you can see that flap in the back of that throat there. You can see the animal's got the GPS logger, its tail's all marked out. You can see it's not trying to rush at me. 
he's walking sideways because he's like, what did you just do to me? Leave me alone. I don't trust you anymore. And then it's going to submerge with its new GPS hardware. And there it goes, just like that disappeared. So that GPS logger, you know, allows us to collect all sorts of data on the movement of these animals. To do so, we got to go out and uh, find where the animal's at. And then I downloaded the data with an antenna to my laptop. And we can produce these cool maps um, showing all the points. This is all the points from one large male that was about nine, nine and a half, ten 10 feet long moving between freshwater bodies and then the saltwater marsh over the period of a little over a year. You know, and with that data, we can take what we learned and use it to educate people to change our strategies for managing the animal and people. So uh, with that information, we found out where these animals were living. Uh, and then we would put up alligator safety stickers. We created a brochure. And in areas where we knew people and alligators might come in conflict, uh, we put up some fences and some, some larger signage to discourage people from interacting or feeding the alligators. So education is always really important during my time. I, I gave uh, dozens of programs to uh, you know, a couple thousand people, um, providing them with a, an experience um, to see alligators in the wild, but one that was safe and um, moderated by me so that there weren't any conflicts between people. And with that, I know I got just a couple minutes for questions. So Sam, throw them at me real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so for the questions that we have here, I'm reading. Um, Brenda was asking, is there a new concern towards crocodilians due to invasive species like pythons in the Everglades and can they outcompete them? Yeah, um, great question. Pythons are messing up pretty much everything in the Everglades. Um, we've seen direct competition between pythons and alligators. Even, you know, you may have seen the wildly popular uh, picture of a, a python that was that eating an alligator. Um, but not only is that, but those pythons are eradicating all really small mammals that alligators may be eating. So there's this competition between uh, snake and alligator for food resources as well. So um, yeah, pythons are pretty terribly uh, invasive down there in the Everglades. Yeah, um, and Brendan was also wondering, can crocodilians reproduce through parthenogenesis like some lizards do? And parthenogenesis is the females basically cloning themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, there's no male involved. As far, I have never heard uh, an example of that. Okay, all right. And then um, do you, uh, as far as like with your, um, with your research with the alligators, um, how do you waterproof the trackers? Yeah, so that is, that's done for us. So um, a lot of these wildlife telemetry sites, um, these companies, you can buy a, a device that is built for your animal. And so that was all waterproofed for us. Okay, great. And then um, Katrina was also wondering, do they normally have a couple of colors on their tails or is there discoloration with age and wear and tear? I'm assuming with identifying them. Sure. Um, alligators in particular, they kind of become like grayish black almost when they get older. But if you remember um, from that early picture of the, the hatchlings, they were very heavily striped. And that's because when they're small, they're more vulnerable to predation. Um, so those bold yellow stripes kind of breaks up their body and allows them to camouflage better into like tall grasses and the marsh and stuff like that. Um, and so let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Those colors fade over time. And when they're adults, they kind of lose that. Well, here, I'll pull it up right here. Yeah, here you can see the bold patterns on those young hatchlings. Yeah, really good for camouflaging grasses, yeah. like you said. Wonderful, okay, um, great. I think that's basically all that we have for the questions. Um, but I want to say thank you so much, Greg, for sharing with us about your research, as well as all of the really cool crocodilian species today. They're, they're awesome. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as always, uh, thank you so much to our museum members who help make events like Reptile and Amphibian Days possible. If you join or renew your membership during this event, you receive a 
free reptile and amphibian days t-shirt which is pictured in the slide that we have here at the end. Um, and there are other great programs scheduled for this week. So we'll post the link to our schedule and how to register for those programs in the chat. And again, this recording will be posted to the Reptile and Amphibian Days program page, as well as being in this playlist um, on YouTube for Reptile and Amphibian Days. And thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you learned a bunch of cool fat, fun facts about crocodilians and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay.